Hello, I'm Pastor Brian, and I want to thank you so much for joining me as we look into God's Word to see His timeless truth. How many of you, as you're serving the Lord, have felt times of discouragement, Times of, why am I following after the Lord? It seems as though those who aren't following after the Lord are prospering. They seem to be okay. Where is God working in my life? Have I seen the blessing that I have ex been expecting? Am I living this in vanity? Is it a profit for me to be following after the Lord? Well, the answer is absolutely it is. And we know that the Lord is returning. He is coming again. But I think this is something that so many believers wrestle with. In fact, this question of where is the Lord and why does it seem that those who don't follow after him prosper has been a question throughout the ages. And it's been a question in, in Malachi's time. So really, the hope is are we living in such a way that we will have the benefit of following after him? And the answer is absolutely yes. But it seems at times that all of us can get in that position of thinking, is it really worth it? Is it of benefit knowing that it is hard at times to follow the Lord, but we know deep down it is the best thing. And so... Malachi, through the Lord, is going to convey in this last little passage before the closing of the Old Testament and a year, about a 400-year period of silence, that they are called to remain faithful to the law that they have been given. And it's a reminder for us to be faithful. But before we dig in any further into Malachi, starting in chapter 3, uh, 13, and just kind of following through, let's go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that as we look into it, that you would open our eyes, that we would have ears to hear, that you would give me the right words to say to communicate the truths that are in scripture. Lord, we thank you for your word and we give praise to your name. Amen. So hopefully you have a Bible with you. Turn it to Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 13, as we finish up this last couple, little bit in the book of Malachi. Now, the Lord wants us to live in hope, knowing that judgment is coming and that we are supposed to point people to Jesus. I think a lot of people, they are excited about Jesus, but as they live their life following after Jesus, if they're not in his word, remembering and reminding themselves of the gospel and the good news and the promises that we have in Scripture— there's a temptation to get distracted, to be pulled away, and to say, where is God? How is he working? Well, God is clearly there, and we can see it throughout history. And we also know, based upon the promises that he gives in Scripture, that he is returning again. And he has given us things to just remind us of his faithfulness. So, Let's go ahead and dig in, starting in Malachi chapter 3, uh, verse 13. And it starts off this way. Your words have been hard against me. That they are, they are not speaking kindly to God. They are saying, where is God? How come God is not working in this? Uh, they had this imagination, I guess, after coming back from exile, they built the temple, but it was not nearly as glorious as it had been before. And, and they're wondering, why are we not receiving these benefits? As we've been looking through Malachi, we see that they're half-heartedly serving after God. They're not wholeheartedly living for God. And I think as a result, they are kind of distorted in their view of thinking and how they're living their lives. And so last week, we kind of looked at the idea of that they weren't giving everything for him, that the tithes that were required in the Old Testament, that they weren't doing that. And I think a lot of Christians kind of live that way in their lives today. That we go, how, how can I serve the Lord with the least amount of energy, with the least amount of sacrifice? And 
That's not really where our hearts should be, especially knowing of the Lord and his love for us and the commands that he gives us, not as a harshness, but as a, as a, as a guide, as a help to help us to live after him. A lot of how you view scripture and how you view God is what comes to mind as you think of God. Hopefully you view him as a loving father who cares and wants the best, but also will give punishment, will give direction, will give guidance, will ask for a turning of heart when it is the wrong way for your benefit. And that's how we need to view God. And when we speak evil against God, he says, that is not what I have for you. And I think these people, either they are in a sense of... Um, idolatry about themselves. So it's kind of an ignorance and following after what they want to do, that they're not truly seeing the love of God. He says, you've been speaking harsh against me. And, and says the Lord of hosts, but you say, how have we spoken against you? It's almost a, a, a slap in the face, a, 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 a harsh word to the Lord. What? We, we're not doing that. We're innocent. And God, again and again, through Malachi, has written, you ask this question, I will show you exactly where you're falling short, as he has already done. So in that the, the way in which they live out their lives shows their heart towards God. And I think that's how we live. As we live our lives, the things that don't line up with God, where we go, well, maybe not so, God. Those are the points in time where God goes, Look, evaluate your heart, repent, turn back to me, and you will see the many great blessings that I have for you. It continues on. You have said, it is vain to serve God. And what they're saying is, uh, there, there's a false purpose. What, what purpose is there in following God? They're so distracted that they go, really? Why follow after God? And, and when we look at scriptures, especially when culture today pushes against the things of scripture, people evaluate, is it really necessary to follow that part of scripture? Whether it's referring to marriage and or whether it's referring into how we should live our lives and, and give and sacrifice and proclaim the gospel. I think a lot of people go, what purpose is it? I, I see my friends, I see my neighbors living in such a way without God. I'm living this way. Is there any benefit to me? And, and really, that's a slap in the face to God. God says, this is what the problem is. You're, you're saying this. And along the same line, they continue and say, what is the profit of keeping our uh, of keeping his charge. You know, why do we have to follow the rules and the regulations of which God has put forth the law? Why do we have to follow the law that God has given us to live? Essentially, they're saying we can do what we want to do. We are okay with sin. We are okay going against God. And continues on to, to give uh, meat to this. Uh, or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts. You know, this the idea that, you know, th there are professional mourners that people could hire uh, at the death of somebody, and they, they scream and they howl and they make a whole big show of it, showing, oh, how they're grieved by the person's death. And there was a grief, but they thought they need to almost do like a performance to show it. And it and, and they're like, what's important is what's in your heart. And so when we follow after God, it's not, let me show what I do. Let me make this great performance of this, but let me follow after the Lord. Isn't there benefit in uh, following after the Lord? And people aren't seeing it exactly like People that go to church each and every Sunday, but their hearts are far from God. They won't see the benefits in walking with the Lord if their hearts aren't turned towards him. They feel as though if we get that checklist and we can go check, check, and, and not really have a heart after God, they think, all right, God's got to owe me this back. And God's like, no, that's not how it is. And then verse 15 it says this, and now we are calling the arrogant 
blessed. What an astonishing thing. They look at the world around them and they go, those who are, are, are against God, those who are prideful and, and, and treat God as common. They said, they are the blessed ones, not us. And, and this is the furthest thing from the truth. And God's going to give them a rebuke for it. Uh, evil doers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. That they, they sin and, and they feel as though that, that in their, that sin, that there's not going to be any consequences. I think that's a lot of people in their lives as they go through life and they're like, well, what does it matter if I go to church or follow after God? Why do I need to surrender my life to him? I'm doing okay. I'm doing all right, not realizing that everything they have is from God. And for a believer to say, there's no benefit in following God. It's just deceived. And so he continues on. He says, this is what you need to do. This is the call that I have for your lives. Verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord. So so fearing, uh, setting them apart, realizing that he is worthy to be feared, that he will bring judgment one day, that we need to walk in his ways and his decrees. So those who fear the Lord spoke with one another. So this whole idea that as we are believers, we're supposed to live life with one another in community. It will build us up. And when we get out of the, that, that circle of people following after the Lord, we'll miss out on that. But stay near to God, to communicate with one another, be built up with one another. That is what we're called to do. So we don't necessarily fall into this trap that these other people have fallen into. Um, spoke with uh, the, Lord, the Lord paid attention and heard them. So he's saying, there's a group of people who are faithfully following after me. And they know that I am active and engaged and that they are blessed for following after me. You don't see this because you're not a part of that. And a book of remembrance was written before him of who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. So this book, the idea that those things that they had done good, they can go ahead and they can recount and see that the individuals who are faithful and the blessings that there are in being faithful, following after the Lord. We know the Lord keeps a record of what we do. And again, it, it, whether it, I think it's a, a way to write those things or to communicate that in Scripture, not that God needs a pen or a paper, but he doesn't forget things. And so... What we see is that God also, we know, records things of those who are faithful, the faithful believers. And the response is, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. They are God's treasured possessions. They are valuable to him. They, they, they belong to him. See, Israel was supposed to be his chosen people. They were supposed to walk with him and know him and, and, and live for him. And they weren't doing that. It says, God's promise is for that, for the nation. There is still unfulfilled prophecy for them. But here, those people that are uh, walking and following after me, they have that. They, they have that guarantee. They know me. And as believers today, today, we know that when we follow after the Lord, when we walk with him, we know that we are his and there is great benefit to that. And the day uh, when I uh, make up my treasured presence, uh, when I make up my treasured possessions and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. So the, this whole idea that as, an, as a father would protect his son, would bring protection to his son, God provides protection for us. For us who know him, we will not be separated from God. We, he has a promise that he will protect us and guide us and bring us. And so just as we remain faithful to him, he will be remain faithful to us. And that is so important that we are his treasured possessions. Um and that and that he will spare man as as his, as his son uh, as those who follow after him. And then verse eighteen. Then once more shall you see 
the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. He said, you don't see it, but I'm going to show you there's a different, there's an outcome that is very different from those who follow after the Lord and those who choose to follow after their own ways and live in sin. And we know that is true all throughout Scripture. If you're a believer, the things that you have as a believer are amazing. They're, out, they're, they're, they're so wonderful, so fabulous. And I think people come times and, and they treat the blessings that God has for us as, as common, as not that special, as even comparable to the, some of the things that are here on earth and the things that we have on God are so far better. Yes, he's created them for our enjoyment, but I can't wait for that day, that, that day when we see the Lord and we see his face more clearly and, and, and knowing the great blessings that we have in him. And, and so that's important how we should live. And there is a distinction between those who don't walk in, in his way. And in fact, saying that that uh, they're, they're almost going, you think it's vain to follow after me? Well, let me show you. There is blessing for those who follow after the Lord. So, there, so there's a distinction between the righteous and the wicked and between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. So it plays out not only where your heart is, but that that heart's affection, the, your heart's desire to follow after God will be seen in the things that you do. Uh, and so many people say, you know, I love the Lord. The Lord is good. The Lord is precious and valuable. And, and, and they give many platitudes with their mouth, but with their actions, it doesn't line up. God's saying, understand that how you live your life, your actions, just as he has communicated to uh, them in the earlier part of Malachi, the way in which you live really communicates your hearts. And these actions that they were doing shows that their hearts were far from God. And they are, though there, but there are some who are serving after him and there is great benefit. There is great profit to it. It's not in vain. For behold, the day is coming, so there's a day off in the future, um, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. So the idea of fire and refining, and we, we kind of saw that last time when we were looking in the book of Malachi, but the idea that God is going to refine, he's going to take that which is pure and, and that which is impure, he's going to separate that, and that which is unpure, it is going to be worth nothing. It is going to be stubble. Um, for he is bringing judgment because they are proud and, and that the, and they are not near God at all. The day is coming, uh, uh, shall, uh, the day is coming, shall set them ablaze. So the idea of refining and fires throughout scripture says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. So they will be completely destroyed. The wicked will experience complete destruction as in contrast with those who fear him. But for you who fear my name, O son of righteousness, shall rise with healing in its wings. And so the idea of the, 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 this idea of the son of righteousness, that which is going to purify. And uh, again, some people would say that this is referring to the Messiah, but I ultimately think that it shouldn't be capitalized here because it's referring to the blessings that come from Messiah that he will bring in the millennium. And so that's kind of how I see it, is that Yes, the blessings of those things that are good are from God. And it's just kind of that whole idea that light exposes witnesses and, uh, or, or brings witness to that which is true. Well, the sun will push away the darkness and, and, and darkness has nothing it can do against it. And God's going to bring this light and he's going to bring this healing to them. And it will bring them joy. And it continues on. It says, you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. You know, there is great freedom in Christ. 
And I think today we can experience that freedom in Christ. A lot of times people distort what it means to be free in Christ. Before we knew God, we could not follow after him. Now that we know him, we are free and that we are, have the ability to follow after him, to know him. And, and our response should be that of great joy. And, and so just as a, a calf leaping, leaping up when it's uh, able to run free, the excitement, we should be excited about that which we have in Christ. And you shall tread down the wicked, for there will be ashes under the soles of your feet on that day when I act says the Lord of hosts. I love it how it's talking about, it's not us, it's but how the Lord will deal with the wicked. And he is going to deal with them such a way that he will give those who follow after him victory. And you can imagine those who walk on ashes, if there was a town, it was burnt down, and those who were victorious and came in as they walked through, uh, that which they were uh, stepping on, those ashes, was proof of the victory. The proof that we will have of God and his faithfulness is that in the end, we will have victory. We will walk with the Lord. We will see his face. We will know him. And so pay attention. Don't live in sin, but live in righteousness. And this is what he says. So uh, so in that day, uh, I, I will act, and he's going to do it. It's for certain. And he puts his name on it, says the Lord of hosts. Remember, and then this is kind of like how you should live. Remember, and, and this is uh, an act of not only recalling, but an act of living out. So to remember something and not to, for it to bring about action is not what it's talking. It's talking about remembering and there's an action that happens from this. Remember uh, the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that I commanded him on Mount Horeb from, for all Israel. And so uh, Mount Horeb, another name is Mount Sinai. So I think clearly he's talking about the, the 10 commandments that he gave Moses on there of, of how they should live. And, and this is their statute of, of what they should do and, and that they need to follow after the Lord. And so, so remember the law that I've given you. It, it is not gone, but be faithful to that. It's not this live how you feel is best, you know, however you want, but I have given you my law. And today we have have God's word. We have the Old Testament. We have the New Testament that tells how we should live and how we should follow after him. And I think that's important uh, of, of not deceiving yourselves, but by being in the word of God, you're reminded of the importance of following after him and his statute. And then this very last little passage before uh, this, you know, there's not another prophet before John the Baptist. He wants their eyes to be open. He wants them to pay attention. And so that common phrase, behold. So pay attention to what I'm going to say. This is really important. I will send you Elijah the prophet before that great and awesome day of the Lord's coming. And so we kind of see a number of different things. But if we remember Elijah, uh, the people were going far from God. I mean, they, were, they were following after uh, Ahab and, uh, and, and Jezebel. They were, they were living in sin, and, and uh, they, they, there were very few left. There, there was a remnant, but many people had turned away from God. The Jews had, had turned away from following after God. And, and Elijah was sent, and he allowed the Jews' to, hearts to be turned as God used him. And so... Uh, I'm going to send you one who will uh, encourage you to turn from your ways and turn to God, to turn out of that your sin that you're in. And that is going to be amazing. Now, we see earlier we talked about John the Baptist. So, yeah, one coming, I say, in the power of Elijah. And, and that's the whole thing we can look throughout Scripture. And we can see that uh, John the Baptist came in the power of Elijah. But he says, I'm, I'm not Elijah. And, and then they reject him. And he says, no, I'm not Elijah. And, and, and in that, um, yes, Jesus comes, but he doesn't come to take the Israelites to heaven then. And there's going to be another time. And that's why I think in the book of Revelation, when we see the two witnesses, that 
one of them is probably is one who comes in the power of Elijah, if not Elijah himself, and, and calls the Jewish people to repent, to turn back to him. And in that, there is a need to, for response. Uh, and, and because that didn't happen initially through John the Baptist, uh, that, that didn't happen, but it's God's going, saying it's going to happen again. And pay attention because one is coming, a prophet, the prophet Elijah, again, whether it's him or, or one in the power uh, of Elijah, the, the one who turns the hearts and minds of his people. So uh, he, God desires the hearts of people. The, uh, and he will turn the hearts of the father and uh, to their children and the hearts of the children to their father. And so a changing of mind, those who are far off will come near to God. And we see that even in, in uh, the book of Revelation, we, where we didn't see it necessarily in the gospel. There are many Jews that rejected him, but we see that uh, there, there's that time when Many people will turn to the Lord and he will fulfill his promises that he has given. And he says, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And that kind of wraps it up. He's like, turn to me. Know that when you, if you are far from me, there is going to be great destruction. And so it's a reminder for each and every one of us to be proclaiming the gospel to those who don't know him, knowing that there is a day of judgment coming and we need to be following after him. We need to be following his decree, what he has commanded us to do, knowing that there is blessing in them. Don't think that uh, it's okay to, to know him and to not walk with him. He says, understand that God... God God is faithful. Need to follow after him. Don't follow after him. Not following after him is like that of those who uh, are unbelievers. Don't be one of those. But the natural response of a believer is following after him. And I'd say if you're living life and you, your life doesn't really line up with the things of Scripture, you got to evaluate, am I really a believer of Jesus? And maybe you're not. But God says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will provide rest. God offers that. God offers deliverance from destruction. If you turn to him, if you place your faith in him, and you believe in him, if you believe that Jesus Christ came, he died on the cross for your sins, if you trust in him, you will have forgiveness of sins, and you will have eternal life. Now, it's not necessarily easy following after Jesus. There are many hard things in following after Jesus, but it is the best thing in the world. And we know that there will be a destruction at time when those who do not trust in him will be separated and, and God's punishment will be poured out upon them for all eternity. And we don't want to be in that category. We don't want anybody else to be in that category. So the call is strong and almost relentless of God calling people to follow after him. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't trusted in Jesus, trust in him, follow after him, knowing that in him there is hope. So thank you so much for taking time to go through the book of Malachi with me. I just want to encourage you just to continue to dig into God's word. Before I go, let me go ahead and just go before the Lord in prayer, just asking that he would work in our hearts. Lord, I pray for those that are discouraged, those that have started following after their own ways, Lord, that they would turn to you, that they would walk faithfully with you. Lord, we thank you for the hope we have in you. We thank you for the rich blessing that comes from knowing you. Lord, help us not to grow weary in following after you, but help us to work with one another, reminding one another, and paying attention to the things that are written in Scripture, knowing that there is hope in you, knowing that there is a day coming where we will have rest in you to a greater degree. And so I pray that those that don't know you would turn to you and that they won't experience the destruction that is promised for those who are far from you. And so, Lord, it's in your name we do pray. Amen. Again, thank you so much for taking time and be blessed.